All right, I did not show you the cleaning process, which is pretty tedious. It's using whichever degreaser is the least harsh for the results you want. You can see I cleaned out the inside, cleaned out the outside, blew out all the passages. So now I've got a clean body for the carburetor, ready to go back together step by step. The reverse of the steps I took to disassemble it. Alright, now it's just a matter of installing everything you took off in the reverse order, starting at the end of the list, working your way up until you put on the last piece. Now I identified and located everything within this little container over here. So the first thing to go on is going to be this poppet valve assembly for the solenoid that uh, they call it a solenoid an aneroid assembly that's what they call it and that's what will add extra air if the mixture is too rich and it le when it gets up to higher altitudes and the air is thinner this adjusts automatically like magic so, this is going to go on there. This is the old gasket in the kit. There will be a multitude of gaskets. This is the only one that matches up. That's easy enough. That goes on this side. Make it fit over these bosses for the screws. And the screws cleaned off, cleaned off the threads. So now they're all ready to go back in. And for running the screws down, do these by hand. Turn it back until you feel the tip of the thread cross the last thread in the body, and then start screwing it down. Get them all started before you tighten up anything finally. tighten these too tight. They're just sealing the body against sealing this poppet assembly against the body of the carburetor. You can more or less seal when it gets snug. Snug them down. Go around. Make sure that the body of that assembly is not bent. Once that's in, take my old gasket, throw them out of the way, then move on to the next piece. Okay, the aneroid assembly goes on next. It obviously mates up only one way. Only three screws hold that on. Again, same thing, get them started by turning them the opposite direction till it clicks, then tighten them down. These screws also have lock washers on them. Make sure the lock washers, if they fell off when you were cleaning, are back on. bottom. That's this assembly here. We've got the gasket. We've got the replacement power valve. And it has its own gasket. Match up what was the kind that had. There's two kinds of power valve gaskets. Where's those power valve gaskets? Some of the items for the rebuild are contained in a smaller bag. One of them is the power valve gasket right there. You 
you don't want to lose the parts contained in this bag, of this little baggie. There's a multitude of these little ones that have more delicate items, smaller clips and gaskets and screws and such. So. Gently open it. Don't let pieces go flying everywhere. There we go. The power valve gasket. You can thread it on there. And what you want. Now if you can see, it's arranged so that as, no matter which way you put it, at least one of the ports is going to be clearing the gasket. I suppose you could try to optimize it so both ports are as, open, as exposed as possible, but the main thing is screwing this down, tightening it till it's snug. Some 2150s have an internal vacuum port. Some of them have an external vacuum port. This one has an external vacuum port, and I'm glad I got the parts carburetor because the internal, the external port on this one, the, the, this is the original. I put it back on the parts card to keep it complete. It was corroded, and it was difficult to clean that off. That was on the original carb. It was difficult to clean it off. This one is from the parts carburetor. Cleaned up nice. Never a bad idea to have a parts carburetor if one is available. You never know what's been messed up or changed on the original carburetor. So this is held on by four screws. If your power valve goes bad, you'll know because it will leak fuel into this bowl at the bottom of the carburetor. This bowl ought to have nothing but air in it. That parts carburetor, the bowl was filled with gasoline. Sure sign that the power valve is leaking. If your power valve is leaking, You'll be drawing extra fuel into your intake system through the vacuum port here that gets connected to manifold vacuum. To do that, one way that if you're running rich with a 2150 carb and you have an external port for your power valve, one easy check is to pull off that vacuum hose. If fuel's dripping out, you've got a leaky power valve. And now, what are we up to? The spring and the idle mixture screws. Now, this is one of those things where I'm glad I had the parts carburetor. Because the original idle mixture screw, this is the original from the, let's see, the focused, I don't know if you can tell. Let's put it up against something clear. Oh, you can clearly see it. I don't know if you can see it there. The idle mixture screw. Yeah. There we go. Come on. Focus, focus, focus. You're not going to focus. Trust me. The spring here bound up and collapsed. The spring is supposed to hold this screw tight against the base of the carburetor. Where it screws in right at the front here this spring collapsed it wasn't moving freely it's locked on there which is why this was probably out three or four turns so a screw an idle mixture screw and spring from the parts carburetor and we're as, we're good to go so screw these in right here and you can see 
how that spring keeps the idle keeps pressure on the idle screw so that it's not going to spin freely from the vibrations of the truck you turn it in till it's seated and if you remember you just turn it until it seats gently you don't want to crank that down the screw that wasn't collapsed that's interesting. This one is going way in. This one is going is not going in as far. But they're the same length. If I wanted to test that out, I could swap them around. But they're what's going to be important. No, well, I guess that is going to be an issue. How far? See how it comes out through the port here and the leftover opening between it being completely closed and it letting fuel and being completely out. That's the effective area for the fuel to flow through. If they're both out different amounts from being seated, I'm not going to get an accurate number. So let's see. Let's swap them around and see if it's something particular to this screw or something that is internal to the carburetor itself, which I'd like not to have to deal with. Let's turn until it's seated. Let's turn this one down. You want them about equal. Ordinarily, you tell the starting point from when they bottom out. So it looks like the bores into which they screw are slightly different. There's something stopping this screw from going all the way in, whereas this one can go all the way in. I don't know if you can see right there a little bit of area in that hole around the needle. It's not particular to the screw because it happened when I had that screw in there as well. Not quite sure what that's going to involve. Cleaned it out so I don't think it's debris. But I do want an even starting point. Now one thing for cleaning this out, it's hard to get in there. That is a very fine passage. Very fine passage in there. So how can you get in there to see if there's any debris that might be blocking it? Well, I've got a parts cleaning brush and a few of these bristles might do the trick. Take those parts, those parts cleaning brush bristles, stick them in there, and see if there's anything that comes out. Thought I had done this before, but maybe not. Maybe there was some little bit that didn't get cleaned out. Give it another shot. It could just be a manufacturing flaw. I mean, the casting on these is not super precise. But that's by hand. That's as tight as it's as I want to turn it. And it still has some area. Not as much. What if I start both of these at about the same point? Let's see how this one is not sticking out as much as that one. Let's see. 
let's measure how far this one is sticking out. Roughly the length of that screwdriver tip. Maybe just this one, so it's sticking about the length of the screwdriver tip. There we go, that was about a half a turn. So this one is a half a turn out more than that one if you're just counting from when it seats. I started, I counted the number of turns in on this one. Let's just go one full turn out from there. One half, one full. Do the same here. One half, one full. The needles are about the same distance out about the same amount of area poking through, uh, through which they're poking, left over after that needle's out of the way. It's a start, but at least they're roughly, roughly identical in their position. Not the number of turns in, but their position sticking out, let's see. about the same amount, mm, a little bit more. It's not precise, but this is not a very precise vehicle. It's about 360 cubic inch engine designed in 1967. Amazing, it works at all. All right, next. What do we have? Ah, I should know because I'm following the pieces. My accelerator pump. This is my choke back there. My accelerator pump is right here. And that has... Where did that housing go? Here we go. That has three... No, four screws and a rubber diaphragm, an umbrella type diaphragm. Fuel can get past it, but then can't get past it one way, not the other way. In this bag right here, and you just push this through, it will draw fuel in through that hole right there and close off when the pump starts pulling through. So you just got to pull this into the into the main well for the float. There we go. It's in. There are two accelerator pump diaphragms. One with a rod, one without a rod. Which do you use? Well, you look at your old one. The old one had a rod. So we're not using this one. We are using this one. Also, keep track of where things were connected. This arm was connected in the second hole, the middle hole here on the accelerator pump arm. It's got a little tang, I don't know if you can see it there, a little tang that I, is going to prevent it from coming out. But you got to put it in with the accelerator pump arm lever pointing the other way. There we go. Now it's on. It's not going to come off. Accelerator pump there. And the, oh, and of course, I need. Diaphragm. This diaphragm is held back by a spring. Here's the spring. And that you can see on the diagram right there. If you can't see it there, can you? Right there. You go umbrella seal. Is that what they call it? Umbrella seal? Yeah, or check valve umbrella. Spring, diaphragm, cover. There we go. So, this is how it sat around that little boss, 
there's a much smaller boss on this replacement diaphragm. So it will just sit there. And really what it sits against is this cover here, or the, the body of the carburetor right there. So. Slide that on through. And I've got four screws to attach it. Four screws, not Phillips head, but hex head. Quarter inch drive hex head. Get them started by hand. This is not a place to use power tools. One more screw. And just using my extension as a nut driver and holding the pump housing against that spring pressure. Let's get them started. There we go. One reason it's good to have a spacer on which to assemble a carburetor spacer on which to assemble a carburetor is that once you get the flow the power valve housing on, the bottom of the carburetor is no longer flat. So it's a pain in the neck to try to drive things down on it. Alright, you don't want to over tighten these guys, but you do want to snug them down. And the leverage you have from a just grabbing onto an extension of the nut driver, you're not gonna do it. But you don't want to go crazy. Tighten in a crisscross pattern. Check that it operates freely. There we go. And one thing to note, this lever is not directly connected to this lever. There's a spring. If it is working as it should, so you see that spring is building up pressure on that accelerator pump, and that will gradually move forward. You want to make sure this moves very freely. I've found that if it binds at all, it will give you a bog when you start moving from a stop. So make sure that it is not going to bind on anything. All right, that's done. Next, there's a weight and a discharge ball. Now, and also a gasket and a, a screw. This is going to be the passage through which the accelerator pump shot is going to pass. And it's going to pass up through the middle of this and then through that hole there and then through the little squirters there in this Venturi assembly. Well. We're going to put that all back together, but it goes in this order. There's the ball, the weight, and then this piece here. It sits like that in this hole right in the center. I've got a replacement ball in this kit. That's the only check ball in this design of carburetor. But this one's not corroded. There's nothing wrong with it nice and clean. I didn't drop it on the ground. So I'm going to use that. And I'm going to use that. So what do we have? Ball pump discharge, weight, metering rod assembly, air, spring metering rod, retainer metering rod. Well, I don't have a spring-loaded metering rod on this one. 
like it shows here in some models, numbers 40, 41, and 42. All I've got, all I've got here is the ball, the weight, the gasket, the cluster, a venturi cluster assembly, another gasket, and this screw. So. Here, there's the old gasket, and they provide two new gaskets. Because for variations, some have a little cut out there, some don't. Which one was this? This is the one left, matches the one with the cutout. So we're not using that, we are using this one. Put the gasket down in there. We put the booster assembly with its nozzles going down into there. And I'm going to put the weight in after I get this in. There's also a little shield, which we put this weight screw, the replacement shield for this. Also a gasket. Is that what they're calling the gasket? They're not calling that a gasket. This goes right there. And I guess it's got to act as something of a gasket there. Yeah. That's got to act as a gasket. I guess a metal shield slash gasket. Because I don't have another seal that obviously would go there. One of these, I suppose, could, but this one has the metal gasket, so we put that weight in there, which keeps that discharge wall in place. I'll fish out this little replacement shield, and then tighten it. And I've got myself Pittsburgh. 5 16 by 6 inch massive screwdriver for reassembling the jets and the float needle assembly, the needle assembly, the seat assembly, not the There we go. That's seated, just tightening it down. Gently, I don't want to strip this one. And you feel when it starts getting tight. There we go. There we go. Done. Moving on. Now it's time to put the metering jets back in. And here's the kind of fit you want. You want your screwdriver to span that hole in the middle and to thoroughly engage the outer edges. I've got this old screwdriver, which is cut specifically for that size, and it works just as well. Just put the jets into location one at a time. They don't take any gasket. Get them screwed in. Do not strip these. I suppose you can repair the threads, but it won't be fun. Get them started and very carefully tighten them the last little bit without distorting the brass. Make sure your screwdriver is centered on that jet. There we go. Main jets are installed. Next item. Next item is going to be the replacement needle and seat assembly. I didn't bother cleaning the old one because it's being replaced, but it's held. It screws down in there. This had a hex fitting. This has a slot, which requires that big screwdriver. And the this is the seat for this needle. The needle goes down, closes off the fuel flow when the float gets high enough when it gets when it goes down it opens up and lets more fuel in 
Very clever. Very old figure. Very old style. Yeah. They're geniuses. All right. Most rebuild kits will come with a replacement needle and seat. You want a gasket on that. There was a strainer as a kind of last ditch fuel uh, filter assembly. I transferred it over from the old one onto this one. A lot of times all the relevant pieces for a particular part of the carburetor will come in the same bag so that red gasket is the only one in this bag that has float components. The springs and the needle so, most likely, it's the one that fits over here. There we go. Fits right on there and gets screwed in to the opening right there. I'm going to use my big Pittsburgh to get it started. Just tightening against that gasket. Let me just do a final tightening with the big ground down screwdriver. There we go. Nice and tight. Now, we're going to put this float assembly there with the replacement pieces. What are the replacement pieces? Well, what do we got? we got three parts to it. We've got the clip. Now let's pull it out of there. Let's pull all these parts out. We've got a clip that goes over the end of that. We've got this clip that goes, as you can see here, over the shaft and retains it inside the pump body, inside the carburetor body. And we have a little shield there. Let's take that off. This come, this just slides right off. We've got a little shield. We have to transfer that. Let's see if we can. Let's see if we can. Put these pieces down. This spring just pops off the top of the needle. Why is there a shield there? Somebody at Motocraft thought it was a good idea. Is it a good idea? I'm going to assume it is. Will it work on this replacement one? No, it won't. So, it's not an exact, not an exact replacement. So I can't use that. I do have to put this new clip on. Which is slightly different than the old one, isn't it? No, there's the old That, that is my old one. Put the new clip on. See, they're very similar. Yeah, basically identical. Same height, same everything. That's going to sit on the end of the float like that. Now this clip. Give me a replacement. Might as well use it. They don't give me a replacement for the spring that puts a counterforce on the float. The spring I'm going to reuse. I'm going to snap off this clip and like the other parts, this one has a little bulge that wraps around and grabs the needle and seat. This one doesn't. so. I'm going to use the one that matches. It clipped down from above on these little slots in the shaft. Put that down on into place. <coughs> Get my needle and seat. My needle hung on there. There we go. That is it. Turn this sideways so you can see. This spring goes down there. 
that needle goes into that seat. This shaft slides into those little slots, and this, turn it this way, this piece goes down. It's always good to have a tiny little screwdriver for moving things like this. Clips onto the assembly. So this can go up and down, but it won't fall out. Well, not going to fall out. This, however, is the first time I've got to set something because this float has to be at a certain height. It's adjustable. What is that specification? Float level dry. 21 64 Call for a float height from the top here of 21 64 of an inch. How am I going to measure that? Well, here we go. They provide a handy ruler for you to measure that. So 21 64 21 64 Unfortunately, this is measured in 30 seconds. All right, so what do you do? You cut the 21 into half. So you say that's 10 and a half 30 seconds. Well, where's that going to be? That's going to be right there, right there. And where do you measure? Well, they tell you on the second page. Float level adjustment, dry setting. This setting is preliminary adjustment to press float tab to gently seat needle. Cut gauge to size, see spec chart at short end. Allow for zero line graduation and locate at one eighth from free end of float, not on the radius. So that is one eighth from here. So what they suggest, what they're suggesting you do is you cut this right there you put it there, you rest it on that float, and you bend this tab, the, the this tab on which the float hangs, until it sits right at that point. So let's get a pair of scissors and cut that. Here with my scissors, so 21 sixty-fourths or 10 and a half 30 seconds. This is 30 second graduation, gradation, graduation, whatever. I'm going to cut that right between the 10 and the 11 line. So it's going to be sitting pretty high in there. I locate it from the free end of the float, not on the radius, but just over here. And I see how much I got. It's got to come up a tiny bit. You have to adjust this because the needle and seat are different. They're going to vary. I want to gently seat. Now, I've got to come up some more. Bend this little tang here. This little tang here is thin and flexible. What's it at? Ooh, that's way too much. Now I'm going to bend it back down a bit. It's just trial and error until it sits at the right height. That's too high. Can't see how it gets to the point. It's just a little bit more. poking my finger when I'm bending it down. My finger's pretty pliable. All right, what have we got? Uh, a little too much. Bend it up a little bit. This is exciting television, folks, I tell you. There we go. No daylight. No daylight between the float and the measurement. So we are right there. I can see the shadow. I don't see any gap of light. So, right there. Oh, you can't see a shadow on there. 
Nope, can't. Let me turn off this light over here for a second. There we go. Maybe you'll see this. There we go. Right there. That is 21 sixty-fourths below the top level of the float bowl. That's the right adjustment. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. The pump rod. Which hole does that go in? That's another adjustment that they had. They say put it in the second one. And it even has on some models adjustability so it goes in different holes based on the season. Clever. Clever. The other, idle, uh, the other adjustments are going to be the choke unloader, the auto choke, the fast idle cam, and the choke pull down. We're not there yet. So let's keep going. Where are we? Right here. Next. Start putting the choke together. Now here's something that my carb on my truck that I rebuilt here did not have that I had to take off of the parts carburetor. Let's get the parts here. Let's get them lined up. Here's the housing. Now I want the orientation of this housing to match the orientation of there we go. To match the orientation that's on my parts carburetor. First, turn this around. And there was a rod that went from this arm down through the body into and connected, connected right here. That rod was missing on my original carburetor. Here it is. Connects to here, and this is the actual part that pulls the that moves the choke. Why am I putting that on now here? Well, <coughs> it has to go through this slot here and connect to that. I'll have to remove that to get it to go over a little tang on this rod. <coughs> also, and here is my bag with choke parts. In this bag is a little plastic slider. I've forgotten I needed one of these until I disassembled my parts carburetor and saw this part. It goes right there. This part goes through it. And then this goes up and this seals. You can see that. This seals that little opening through which this rod passes. But in order to get that on, I have to put it on now before I put this choke assembly and when I'm putting this choke assembly on. The other things that have to be lined up is the fast idle cam right here. That's going to connect with the rod to this one here. There's also going to be a gasket there because there's an internal passage right there that draws air from a tube that goes down to the intake manifold and draws heated air through this unit and heats up, partly heats up this choke coil which is going to grab this tang. If you've never seen a choke at work, it's pretty amazing. This bimetallic coil spring is going to change its length on one side more than the other when it heats up. That will cause this coil to move this tang in one direction or the other. The movement of that grabs this little arm here and opens the choke. So this all has to be arranged in the right part, connected to the right piece. This is the orientation. Here's that gasket right here. And I know because I had a gasket. It fell off. It stuck to the body of the carburetor and then fell off. Let's get this sideways. Oh, 
let's connect. This rod here, this rod here goes into that hole right there. No clip holding it on. Just it, it's up against the carb main body so it has no space to pop out. So I've got to hold that in place there. I put this gasket on right here. And I also want to make sure all my other levers and pieces are in the right orientation so that I don't put it together in such a way that it can't be adjusted properly. All right. That goes there. That goes there. That's going to go up here. And these screws, starting with the one that goes through that gasket, want to go through that gasket down here. There we go. Likewise, these screws have lock washers. Make sure you include those. On that one, and also my cleaned out these holes when I was assembling this. When I was washing it out, I cleaned out all the holes with a little pipe cleaner type brush, got a set of cleaning brushes. Okay. against the gasket, tightening this against the body. There we go. That's on. Does this move freely? That moves freely. This moves freely. This rod is going to be connected to the bottom rod, uh, to the throttle kick down for the fast idle by this now, let's turn it so you can see. There's one other linkage. This linkage connects this kick down right here to this adjustment lock. And that is held in place by two eclipse. And I'm going to guess that these are the eclipse designed to replace the originals. So let's get those out. Don't lose them. I'll go over these others in a moment. These just push on over the little slot. Let me show you what we're talking about here. How do these E-clips grab and stay? Well, they're called an E-clip because they look like the letter E. And they just grab this groove and you just end up pushing it on. So get it through the hole with a proper orientation on this one. It should be facing inward. And might as well get them both in their appropriate holes. Sometimes, if that rod is available to you, you can just push them on by squeezing the E-clip against the shaft with a pair of needle nose. That's not going to be possible on this one. So what you can do is put that clip into the slot and then just push down, sometimes by hand. And that was enough for this one. Grab another E-clip right there. Push that one down on the bottom half of the shaft. Make sure it's seated all the way. You don't want that popping off, rendering your choke inoperable. And the other thing you want to make sure is that this inner tang, this inner tang of your E-clip is also in that slot. Now, look at this. They got three nice new screws, as well as a weight. I don't have a weight in mine, 
or at least not one that is visible in evidence to me. So, I'm not going to be using that weight. I am going to try to use these screws. Why do they give you screws? Well, because sometimes, like on this one, the choke cover is riveted on. So you have to cut off these rivets, drill out the hole, and then use replacement screws to place the rivets to attach the choke cover and thermostatic coil. Does this fit? Yes, look at that, it does fit. I'm pleased at that because I had a hodgepodge of screws on there from I don't know what. Those were the three screws that were holding the choke cover on. Now, I got these three screws. I've got this cover that holds it in place. Clean that out. And there we go. Sits like that. Sits in there. But I got a gasket. And this was the original gasket that sat in here. Giving you a slot for the lever to move. I've got a replacement gasket, much like that. Now, which way do those holes go? Hmm. Looks like this is probably only going to fit on one way. Because we have these bosses that prevent it from going on just any way. Is that going to be the way? No. So this is going to have to be the way, right? No. What's going to be the way? That lever moves in that arc. So the gasket has to match that. Let's see what this did. Nope. There we go. That was the arc. And as that, well, there's only so much it can go. New gasket has to go on the same way, right? We assume, and there we go. This goes on, and that tang grabs that slot. That tang grabs that slot, and seats down on the gasket. Try to make sure I get that seated. But there's one adjustment, only one adjustment, one little. Why is that not seating? This did not grow, it's no bigger than it was earlier. Why is it not seating? Well, in any case, there's this. Ah, there we go. It's a little out of shape, I guess. There's one adjustment notch, one adjustment indicator there, and one arrow, a V-notch. That is where the adjustment directs, the specifications adjust it to the Y-notch. I guess we're going to call that a Y-notch. Why does it call it a Y-notch? Because it looks just like a Y when you get it all lined up. We'll say that's why they call it that. That's it. I now screw down this cover in an orientation where all the tangs, all these little mounting bosses line up. Which one is that? Looks like that's going to be it. There we go. I'm going to use my nice new screws. They don't have lock washers. They are long enough. They are the same thread as the original holes. So just tighten those, get them started. 
and if it turns out that this thermostatic choke cover is non-operational, doesn't work, spare right there. Don't, hopefully don't have to buy a new one. I'm sure they're available. But, I got a good one. No need to. Alright. Alright, what have we got left? What's left? Where are we? We got all the thermostatic cover, retainer, screw. Gasket, air horn. Now we're ready to put the top of the carburetor on. That's quite easy. It only goes one way. We have one gasket that will work for it. And that gasket's only going to fit one way. If I tried to fit it the other way, it sort of would work, but there'd be a mismatch of this hole over here. You want that hole, line up with that hole in the gasket. There we go. That's going to line up. This gasket's not going to be seeing constant fuel. It's above the float level. The only gasket, there's no gasket below the float level, so it should be a leak-proof carburetor. It won't be, but it should be. Now, I'm going to hook that up later. I'm going to get started. All my nice clean screws through the gasket. There's six screws. Drop them through the holes. Get your Phillips head screwdriver. Wiggle them down to wiggle the cover down. Start tightening them in. Two on either side of this additional airflow valve for the that's peculiar to the 2150. Let's in extra air to compensate for altitude, high altitude. This little shield is blocking any air from coming up into the air cleaner pass with the, where that choke rod passes through. And note these do have these do have lock washers. You don't want to over tighten these because you can bow the carburetor cast top casting. That's going to produce air leaks. Not so much that would change your fuel mixture, but that would let air get in, unfiltered air get in, fuel the slosh out. So, in a kind of crisscross pattern, starting in the middle, working your way out. Take up the slack in those lock nuts and compress the gasket evenly. Move up till it's equally snug. Just using my fingertips, not going to crank down on it, just fingertips are enough to tighten it. And I've taken up all the slack and all those screws. Yeah, there we go. Now, this little rod. I noted where it was positioned. Oh, that's fun. I noted where it was positioned on the original carburetor, or the parts carburetor, and that was on the inner hole. So, I'm going to take this off. Reattach that rod, which just slipped down off of that shaft. Trust me, when it's in, installed, it's not going to be able to come off. little tang there that needs to go through a hole, that slot in between number hole number one and two and it slipped off. Slipped off everything. Alright, let's get that back on there. I swear it will not slip off when it's installed. It just doesn't have the room to slip off. Now it's slipping off everything. It's not going through that little slot. Worst case scenario, I can always borrow. There we go. 
There we go. Now let's get it through. I don't know if you can see. I'm going to get it through that hole on that linkage and then reattach it. There we go. Start that screw. And that's the one that, that, that was the rod that my the former owner of this truck had removed so he could install a manual choke cable. It was quite clever. He ran a cable up through this hole, used a hose clamp to attach it to this boss here for the choke. There we go. Look at that. Tighten that. It moves freely. It moves as it should. Tighten that securely, and that's not going to come off. Nope, that's not going to come off anymore. You can see it just doesn't have the clearance to come off. See it? So, that's that. Choke opens, choke closes. Now, what's left? Ah, yes. Oh, one thing I forgot. Identification tag. That goes on one of these screws here. Let's not forget that so we don't forget what we've got here. This one was on this screw originally. It doesn't really matter which direction it points. I'll point it to the back because that's where this one was originally pointing. On this one, it was pointing forward on that front screw, the other screw. There we go. Next, I've got this fitting for the front. This was missing on my parts carburetor, so I'm going to put it on here. Tiniest, tiniest little wrap of Teflon. Probably wouldn't need it. I don't think it had any originally. But it's not a bad practice to use fuel resistant Teflon in this position. Take up any flat any variations in the pipe thread. This is a tapered thread going into the body there. As you tighten it down, the taper is going to reduce the clearance between the threads. Get as far by hand. Okay. Tighten it till it's snug. I suppose there is a torque setting for these. I've never really noted that. This is one of the few fittings that if it's leaking, you might solve the leak by just tightening it down a little more. You don't want to tighten it so so much that it cracks the body of the carburetor right there. But the carburetor is pretty beefy and I'm not really pushing too hard. That should work. When you do loosen the fuel fitting, it's a flare fitting in here. You want to put a wrench on that so that when you're loosening the fitting, you're not going to loosen the base there as well. All right, we're just about done. What have I got left? I've got this choke pull-off, which screws right on there and attaches. This one doesn't use an E-clip. It has a bent rod, a bent choke rod. Just put it on, twist it up, and there we go. This also a quarter inch a quarter inch hex and you don't want to cut new threads with these self tapping screws you see they're very coarse thread probably run on down at the factory 
cutting new threads as they were installed. You want to use those old threads. There we go. And snug them down. If you have a nut driver, you can do it without a wrench, but I don't have a proper nut driver here. And this is going to have a vacuum hose that goes from here to there. I'm going to get myself a new one. It's just the length of vacuum hose, nothing special. But I'll do that when I redo the vacuum, before I put it on the car, redo the vacuum lines. All right, the carburetor is all assembled.